Hello everyone, Rachel Weaver here. I'm on faculty and staff at Lighthouse Writers Workshop. I've been working on a series of videos in which I ask another uh, faculty member at Lighthouse some questions on a certain topic um, of, of craft. So today, Eleanor Brown has joined me. Thanks for being here, Eleanor. Hi. Hi. We are gonna talk about POV today. I have some pressing POV questions that you are going to shed light upon. Are you ready? Oh, I hope so. I hope I have some pressing POV answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the main thing I would love you to talk about is how, what are some tricks or what are some ways that you have found either in your own writing or in all of your teaching um, in which writers get omniscient and omniscient POV to work really well? Um, so that meaning they overcome sort of that inherent distance that happens in a piece of writing when when writing from the um, when using omniscient, um, you know, sort of that distance that the reader can feel between the the character and um, and themselves um, or any other you know problems that come up. What are, what sort of advice do you have for anyone working in omniscient POV or considering writing a book in that POV? Um, you know, and I think that for any point of view question, it's really uh, it's really about making a set of rules for yourself because first person can actually feel incredibly distant if you haven't, um, you know, sort of figured out who that person is and you haven't come up with that voice. Um, when I, I was reading an, an interview with Emma Donahue, who wrote Room, which is narrated from the point of view of what he's like, five or six year old boy or something. And I mean, it's a fantastic and deeply upsetting book. Um, but her, the narrative voice is just so good. And children are like notoriously hard to write. I'm so suspicious when I start to read books with children and I'm like, I don't know, it's going to mess it up. But she did it so well, and she talked about how she did that was that she came up with rules for the way that he would talk. So one of the one of the rules is he really doesn't have any other people in his life. So instead of saying he or she, he says you, because he only he's only ever talking to his mother. So like she had this set of rules that she came up with, and I feel like that's really helpful. First, to decide to yourself, what is the distance that you're looking for? Like, are you looking for an omniscient point of view? that feels distant. Steve Allman, for instance, who teaches at Lighthouse a lot, um, is really in love with this sort of 19th century narrator omniscient point of view. So this is sort of like this um, like Dickensian presence where there's someone narrating the story, but we never know exactly who they are. And that still feels distant from the characters, even if we know a lot about what's going on inside them emotionally or intellectually. Um, or you can have something that's a really, really close third, um, which is something that I like writing in a lot. I actually think that, um, it's funny, we were talking about this before and you were saying you feel like a lot of people default to omniscient because they feel like it's easier and I feel like people default to first person because they think it's easier. And I think first person is hard because <laughs> you're so limited. But if you come up with a set of rules for how close you want to be and then what that means. So in my second novel, Light of Paris, um, there was a first person narration and then a third person narration. And the first person narrator was an artist, a visual artist, a painter. And so one of the things that I did was I made sure that when she walked into a room or she noticed something, what she was noticing was relevant to what she would notice, right? And that makes me feel closer to her. I think you were talking about that with Erica Krauss. Um, mm -hmm. already. There are all these fancy terms that you and I who are not fancy MFA people don't use, like <laughs> objective correlative and free and direct. Um, but so, and free and direct is really, I think what I'm aiming for, where it's third person, but it's close enough that it feels like first, so right. that no one else could narrate it the same way. Right, which is when you employ a bit more of that interiority, right? You you try to convey the um, elements of the setting and elements of how they're feeling about what's happening through their description of it, right? Which can be done right. in a close third as well as first, but it's a little more expected in first, I think. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree with that. But I feel like it can be super, super effective in third. And it can even be in the same way that you think about um, 
you know, dialogue, like how does this particular person speak in a way that nobody else would speak, right? How do I know it's them? And so it's things about vocabulary and sentence length and how, um, how long are paragraphs in that person's section? So even if that, if, even if we're, we've got a close third person and we're narrating something outside, it's going to tell me something about that third person narrator or the character in that third person narration if they have super long chunks of text or if they have really short chunks of text, right? So it's like getting whatever feeling you want to get. Um, and that's again where I go back to that question of rules. So like what are the rules of the way that this particular third person narrator is going to work in order to make you feel really close to them and like they are an individual? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also I think, I think it's important to consider how does this point of view help me, or I guess does it help me tell this particular story of this particular person in a stronger way? Right. So is this distance, um, you know, is this is the distance that that I'm creating with with an omniscient um, narrator adding to, you know, sort of the, the nuance of the story or the, the telling of it. Right. Is it creating a feeling in my reader that gets across something um, that I'm trying to get across through the story more effectively? Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, that's character choice and voice choice as well. Um, I'm thinking about this, you know, I often deal with students who are like, oh, but my character is passive and that's why nothing happens in the story. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm like, well, your character, your character both are trying try to take action at some point. But to think about who is the person who is going to offer us the most insight into this or if you, like I do, like to write multiple characters, what's the specific mesh of them, right? So how is this character offering something that's different from this character? And how can I explore that through looking at their particular point of view? And yeah, I mean, there are characters who want to keep us far away. And so that's kind of interesting in third person because you can allow them to do it. One, another thing I talk a lot about with um, my students is how to communicate over a character's head to the reader. Um, and sort of the best example I, I can think of this is um, a book that I'm not going to be able, not going to be able to remember the title of. Um, it's the, it just came out as a movie. Uh, Sofia Coppola directed it. It's about the, the women in um, like Nicole Kidman's in it and civil, during the Civil War. Oh my God, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, you'll think of it as but like that's all for it's also all alternating first person, but it's like those characters don't know their flaws, but it is so clear to us right when we when we read those sections, like what their their problems are. Right. That's like Erica's Erica Cross's martini glass of knowledge. Have you ever seen her draw that? I don't think so. She draws a martini glass, and then at the bottom is um what the character knows and then in the middle is what the reader knows and then at the top is what the author knows right. so the author can convey things to the reader that the main character is totally unaware of right, right. so right. The, the author has or sorry the reader has more did i say that right main character at the bottom um reader in the middle and then author at the top mm -hmm. um because there's a lot of tension in that right when when the reader begins to understand things that the character is not picking up on Mm -hmm. Right, um, right. It creates tension and it creates, you know, driving questions like, is he going to figure it out? Or, you know, is she going to come to this realization that I just came to as the reader? Right. Um, but again, I think that's something that you have to set up with, um, set up within your rules, right? Are you going to allow that to happen? Because if you're doing a really close third person point of view that feels like a first person, then you don't have that kind of telescoping ability, you know, to back off sometimes and to go closer sometimes. So you really have to think about like, what details are you choosing that that character would see and feel um, that uh, in order to communicate above like over their head to the reader um or through through the top of that martini glass to the reader right. um and so i see, feel like it's it's important to remember that because once you've committed we're looking for consistency right we don't want a character's voice to change we don't want um uh we don't want the point of view to change unless we're given some guidelines for that i talk a lot uh with my students about 
um, things being kind to the reader. So for instance, like if you have alternating points of view, it's very kind to the reader for there to be a pattern to that. Yeah. Um, or generous to the reader. You don't have to do it, but you always remember that you're asking the reader to do to do more work when you play around with things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's something else I was going to ask you. Oh, so I guess in conclusion, um, what sort of do you have any advice for someone who is working in omniscient? Um, Aside from defining the rules, or maybe you could just say more about defining those rules, like what sort of things do we have to think about in omniscient um, or in, you know, close third um, or even first, like what sort of, what sort of elements should we think about as we're defining those rules mm -hmm. um, to keep it consistent? Because you're right, I think it's very irritating as a reader when those rules are constantly shifting and you're being forced to navigate the shift in the rules as well as the story. I think it can be very overwhelming for the reader. Well, and I think it's also, um, yeah, it's, it's not generous to the reader. And then sometimes it is because the writer hasn't done the work that they need to do to set up those rules. So you've taken my class on the Enneagram for writers. <laughs> um, so uh, at Lighthouse, I call it the nine people you meet in stories. And that's one of the lenses that I use to create those rules. So first of all, like I was talking about, is there something about this character? So if they're a visual artist, what are they gonna, what are they gonna notice when they walk in the room? And that's very different than what a musician would notice if they walk in the room. Um, but then also sort of like how forthcoming is a character. So I'm writing something right now, which has an Enneagram type five, if you're familiar, which is the thinker. Um, and she is a very slow processor um, of her emotions. So one of the rules that I had to set up for myself is that when, she, when something happens, she does not react to it immediately. We do not get her reaction immediately. And that's super awkward as a writer, because I'm used to just being like, and then she felt mad, right? And I've taken that away. So being consistent about that rule makes it more difficult for me as a writer, but it makes her more consistent as a character. And then it gives me room to create things with her. So I just had, and I think like, her her third narrative chapter she had an immediate feeling and that was a shift for her so creating that rule for how she reacted to things emotionally actually allowed me to create a, a better character or to create a better character arc um, because I'll be able to continue to do that and she's not going to be filled with tons of feelings by the end <laughs> um, but to think specifically in the same way that you would about if you were creating a first person narrator to think specifically about how it's particular to this person mm -hmm. and then um, offer that I mean really if you're doing a super close third person it should feel different you should almost forget which which voice it's in i don't know if you've ever had that experience i've had that where i've you know referred to books and i'm like oh this book is in first person then i go back and look and i'm like no it is not it's just that we're so close and i feel like close third is what's um popular now like it's a very it's very comfortable if you're going to write that way if you're going to write an omniscient then, then as close as possible is good but we also see people like steve almond who want that Dickensian narrator hovering over things. And I think you can do really interesting things uh, with that too. Um, but so coming up with the rules, again, I feel like it's just figuring out who the particular person is and then making that rules of how they speak, how they think, how they, how they would narrate a story to you, long paragraphs, short sentences, complex vocabulary, not. Um, Humor is a big one for me, like who's funny, who makes jokes, who makes jokes externally, who makes jokes internally, and figuring out what those are, and then just putting that that all on the page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eleanor. That was super interesting. Thank okay. you so much, Rachel. Yeah. All right. See you later. Bye.